First of all, thanks, Corey, for your talk. Um, in a way, that was already a fantastic introduction to the panel today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about where this panel comes from, why um, we're talking about the politics of making today. And um, I guess for me, it started with a personal interest um, where I've always been interested in cultural production, which um, is able to also kind of critically evaluate its own existence and processes of production, which asks uncomfortable questions and also proposes uh, alternatives for the future. And in a way, the, the whole day today, the, the idea of having a, a maker meetup uh, was meant as, as such a day. You know, we did the making yesterday and we had an enormous turnout, um, lots of people making, uh, being engaged with this, uh, learning new skills, but also obviously the makers being able to share their uh, pr production of any kind. Um, and today was meant as a, as a, I guess, a bit of a counterpoint to this to be able to discuss some of these issues, some issues that Corey has already raised, um, and then obviously others that you know our panel will will point out. Um, the politics of making, or the, the politics of any kind, I guess, suggests an investigation into uh, the power relations and uh, values inherent within contemporary digital culture. Um, so, for example, this is signified by. Cody Wilson, a 25-year-old law student from Austin, uh, who successfully fired the first 3D printed gun not that long ago, I think it was the beginning of May, uh, which, you know, that was around the same time that I was thinking about the panel, thinking about what would be an interesting and worthwhile uh, topic to talk about. But it's also signified by things like uh, Sugru, which allows us to fix stuff when it's broken, and that, of course, uh, kind of um, requires larger corporation to, to question, you know, how we are producing things if they if they break that easily and um, asks us about excessive consumerism. Um, the, there is a recent book that came out by um, Sinead Murphy. I don't know if any of you have read it. It's called uh, The Art Kettle, and in there. Um, the, she discusses kind of uh, art and craft in a contemporary context and says, um, art is a mode of control that plays an important function in late capitalism and that therefore the return to craft is as much an act of political resistance as it is an aesthetic choice. And she arrives at this point following um, William Morris, who obviously at the end of the 19th century bemoaned the separation of labor from life, following Marx, uh, the separation of practice from life uh, and the loss of wisdom that can be gained from experience. So from actively making things, from actively breaking things to put them back together. Um, Murphy says that, Morris, um, says that for Morris, the existence, uh, an existence free of the stuff and the skills is an existence in, um, is one for which um, possibilities of creativity, originality, and for resistance are gradually dissolved. So Morris knew that creativity and ori originality, that thought itself as a skill, requires practice. So it requires that making, it requires that breaking. This is, of course, set against the backdrop of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and there is an idea that we're in a new Industrial Revolution we can discuss this if you like, I'm, um, I'm not sure. But here's what I initially wrote for the panel to give you a bit more of an outline. So I said, digital technologies and the internet have changed the process of production, distribution and consumption, giving the amateur the same voice and means of production as commercial producers. Um, the tools of production have gone through a process of democratization. Furthermore, the internet has given rise to the potential of global and mass collaboration. Um, these developments are essentially possible through open structures and sharing. Um, however, and as Corey has already pointed out, um, there are moments within this that don't yet allow us to share fully 
or that are not uh, entirely open. Maker culture, however, makes use of these developments to invent, prototype, and find unique uses and applications for technologies. Making and tinkering is not just a pastime or a hobby, however. It actively encourages pricing open of black boxes of proprietary software and hardware. Um, making collapses, perhaps, the separation of praxis and life into the same process. It encourages the development of skills and experience and following Morris, therefore creates possibility for creativity and also for resistance. Um, Chris Anderson, who is currently thinking about the new industrial revolution, um, because it now obviously also involves um, uh, manufacturing processes, not just the kind of digital. Um, however, while the, the first industrial revolution brought us societal divisions and an alienation from processes of production, does this new industrial revolution actually support this more collaborative approach? Uh, and also horizontal approach to production, so that might be one question. Does it bring together the process of production to enable creativity and resistance? Or is it naive to understand these processes um, that are enabled by the network, by uh, the change of production processes, um, to understand these as truly democratic? Um, Tiziana Terranova in her uh, kind of talk about free labor, points out that computer networks are the material and ideological heart of inform informated capital. The internet uh, advertises on television and portrayed by print media seems not just the latest incarnation of capital's inexhaustible search for new markets, but also a full consensus creating machine which socializes the mass um, proletarianized knowledge workers into the economy of continuous innovation. So there's a bit of a um, potential dilemma here. So as a summary, power relations and questions of value in terms of the act of making and the products produced um, through uh, the processes of the maker culture become evident, for example, when guns can be printed and successfully fired, when we can fix our products rather than simply replace them, but also when, as Corey pointed out, um, we are uh, inhabit, uh, in, we are refused access to some of our technologies in order to kind of uh, reinvent them and push them further. So um, this panel therefore aims to explore making as a political act and asks, is making an act of political resistance can it be that, um, with a potential to kind of challenge pervasive processes of late capitalism, or does it just sit within it? Um, at this stage, I'm going to introduce the panelists briefly. They're all going to do a, a very brief introduction about themselves and their practices, um, and then we will kind of start a process of discussion. So um, I'm going to start with Nelly, who will also be do the first presentation, actually. This is Nelly over there. Sorry, I'm going to do the introduction first. Um, she, re she responded to our call uh, for makers with a proposal to talk about the change makers. She's from a craft and design background. Uh, she's a maker with passion in upcycling. Um, she's currently studying uh, Masters of Design for Services at Dundee University. Uh, her research focuses on how practicing designers will be able to effectively communicate and demonstrate the value of design in addressing challenges that society faces, particular as a result of the current economic crisis. She's a member of the Change Makers Group, um, which investigates how this initiative could help and empower Greek people and citizens to become active and take ownership. We also have uh, Sarah Corbett sitting right next to me here. Um, her background is in engaging people in global injustices, uh, working with Christian Aid, DFID, and most recently Oxfam. She started doing uh, craftivism uh, in 2008 as a hobby. However, due to demand, uh, set up the Craftivist Collective in 2009, which now has thousands of supporters across the world. Um, she also has a book coming out on craftivism uh, in October this year, so keep an eye out for that. We've got Martin, 
Martin Dittes, who is a trustee of the London Hack Space, mm. uh, which is one of the largest hack spaces, certainly in the UK. Um, he's also the organizer of the Electromagnetic Field Camping Festival that take, took place last year. Uh, he's one of the initiators of Hack the Barbican, which is coming up in August this year, so keep an eye out for that as well. In 2011, Martin spent several months with the Occupy London tech team, where he helped to set up the infrastructure, uh, but was also involved in the kind of coordination of this large and distributed community. Um, and Irini already did the honor of introducing Corey, obviously. So if I could ask Nelly to give you a presentation. Could you could you please the uh, switch to the projector to the We could have a quick chat while we're waiting for technology. What, what, what is the politics of making? Uh, I, 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 I mean, I, I have sort of my perspective on this. I'm, you, you guys have, have your perspectives on this. Um, maybe as a way of getting the discussion started before we give our presentations. Uh, maybe you guys have perspectives on, the, on that. What, what, ah, there you go. Th think, think about it. And then uh, we'll get back to you. Where would I set the boundaries of copyright? You wouldn't is want the, them pirated, I yeah. presume, because you, you, so you make a living. Here's what I think. I think that historically we made copyright by observing whatever it was the industry was doing and saying, okay, those are the rules for the entertainment industry. Um, and the way we figured out whether you were in the entertainment industry was whether you were making or handling a copy, because every... Oh, okay, I'll tell you later. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Um, today I will talk to you regarding my perspective for politics of making, it's regarding the craft and the craft of design. So um, the term and the value of design crafts has changed through the years and design constitutes and um, made part of in community and is directly affected by economy, technology and society. As a consequence, it's always changing in order to respond to the changings um, that's uh, affected and occurred by the current social economic crisis. It's an energetic and a life field that continually transforms in order to meet current needs and respond to current problems. Design has always focused on people's needs and on the ways and strategies that will heal social gaps and enhance the quality of everyday life. So that in the meantime, the current approach or perspective of design, it's called service design, and it's human-centered, and this has led to users to actively take part in the design process, co-creating the service. 
This co-creation is one of the most important reasons why service design can have such a big impact on mobilization of citizens, including citizens in the creation or, or improvement of a service or process that aims um, at developing their everyday experience, helps in addition creating a better experience for them, remove user hesitations or inhibition regarding adopting the service. But the main interrogation that occurs at this period of time is the way that designers will implement all these theoretical and principles in order to design for the real world and focus on the possible solutions of, mon of momentous social problems that we tight nowadays. Um, the last five years, uh, the number of countries facing problems uh, caused by the financial uh, recession has in increased significantly. And unfortunately, Greece, the city, that I, the country that I came from, is one of the top of the list who is plagued by it. So uh, the situation in Greece is obvious of concern to the people of the nation in numerous ways, economically, culturally, existently, and so on. There are problems such as the complete loss of credibility of evolutionary and emancipatory narratives, including development, progress, and sustainability. What the recent history of Greece exposed is that while the powerful and privileged will continue to strive to retain their power and privileges, they are fundamentally failing to deal with issues that are deciding the fate of humanity, such as planetary destruction, a climate heading towards perhaps already in house, and an ever growing volume of displaced people worldwide, increasingly the spread and the growth of asymmetrical warfare as a future of late modern life. So in periods of time that an economic recession or a global problem occurs, people tend to respond with two completely different ways. A large proportion of the population, the so-called activists, try to express their opinion, their discontent, and simultaneously to remain active as citizens. As a result, they take offensive and vain approaches. On the other hand, there is another amount of people that remain idle, inactive for a solution. There is no answer that states the wrong or correct. The most meaningful answer is that there is absolutely no improvement either way. So, what is needed are new transformation ways of thinking and active that activate and engage people to take ownership and contribute to community development for cultural and social change, given the failure of political parties to move beyond their predictable responses to crisis. Um, creative communities having an important and embedded role in communities ecosystem have proven over the years that have the ability and the knowledge to empowerment and help people to confront all these problems occurred by the current economic crisis. Creative practitioners have the skills and the mindsets to empower residents to become decision makers, fostering collaboration and co-creation as far as impel and organize solidarity actions. Now regarding the change makers that I'm part of it, having understood the huge potential those makers in craft and design activities have to contribute to community development and social change, formed in the UK riots in order to explore how craft can be a stronger and more focused for, for positive and social and cultural change. The change makers is a way that could help to carve out a space for a civil society to collectively brainstorm ideas to find solutions for a better way of life that links community together and encourages urban social innovation that target areas of life ranging from economical to personal well-being and beyond. Critical in order to achieve important social changes Public and open debates should be encouraged and used by designers in creating the needed solution to reclaim the future. Communities and private parties have to reason to the occasion and design solutions that fit their needs that can be implemented with their limited resources. Actively take part in the decisions together with our fellow countrymen we secure to ensure a better life and a better future. And according to Aristotle, a man who did not care enough to take part in the decision about his city, he was not peaceable, but useless. Thank you very much.
slide's going to pop up now. There we go. smooth. Um, hello, I forgot my watch so hopefully someone can like ding a bell if I go over but I will try not to. Um, I guess some of this sort of might overlap a bit with what Nelly said. Um, my background, you heard a bit about it, um, I've always been an activist since the womb. I think I was brought up in a low income area in Liverpool in the 80s under Thatcher and a militant council so it was a double whammy. Um, been squatting in houses aged five with my little beaker next to a Martin Luther King banner with a quote on it. Always been involved in activism, was voted head girl by my peers to campaign because they thought I'd go and do it, which I did. Um, campaigned to eradicate gym knickers, lost that one. But we did win lockers and we did win recycling bins. So always been <laughs> involved in that way. Um, always campaigned at uni and luckily for the last six years I've been able to be a full-time campaigner for different charities like Oxfam and Diffid. Um, but a couple of years ago I felt completely burnt out as an activist and I thought, oh crap, maybe I can't be an activist, maybe it's just I can't fit into that mould. I'm not a natural extrovert, I don't like dressing up, I don't like shouting with placards, I don't like telling people what to do. I don't like demonizing people, and there's some forms of activism that, that completely drained me. I don't like being around a lot of people, no offense. It drains me of energy a lot of the time, so I really like being on my own and thinking a lot. And at the same time of having this wobble, feeling like a burnt out activist, but still feeling really passionate to try and make the world a better place for everyone, and always having that you know, fire in my stomach, I got into cross-stitch and I bloody loved it. I'd spend like five hours cross-stitching, forgetting to eat, forgetting to go to the toilet, and I thought, I love this so much, surely there's a way I can use it to really fight for a better world. So I googled craft and activism, and this term craftivism popped up. But there was no projects or groups I could join, so the lady who coined the term, Betsy Greer, gave her blessing for me to have a go and do things like this. Um, and just sort of see if, it, if I could do something with it, with these loves and passions I had to try and merge them together. Because I always want activism to be threaded through everything I do, and I think it should be for everyone else. I don't think it's something we opt into. I think it should be something that we always think about. So it's exciting to be on the panel with these ex inspiring characters. There's three things I want to tell you quickly about, about craftivism that I think are benefits, and then maybe we can elaborate a bit more in the discussion. But the first one is that it's slow activism. You have to stop. You don't look at your phone. You're not watching TV while you're doing it. You're not quickly signing a petition online or lots of petition cards. It takes a while, otherwise you mess it up. And if you're stitching a quote or a statistic or a fact or a little slogan you've come up with about an issue you care about, you're constantly reading it to make sure you don't make a spelling mistake. And it's very repetitive, so you're naturally in meditation, so it really helps you focus on that issue. And it helps you focus on what you can do as an individual, put yourselves in the shoes of the victims, of the perpetrators, what can you do as a voter, as a consumer. It gives you that time to really think. And I worry that as activists, often we see something, we're really worried about it, we're really you know, shocked by it all, and we want to do something quickly. But often we know in society, if we react quickly, sometimes it's not the best strategic thing to do. So for me, it really helped me stop and think again for hours doing this. And I thought, brilliant, maybe there's something in this. The second thing is that when you give someone a piece of handicraft, if it's small and handmade and not on a machine, not by a kid in a sweatshop, people tend to be quite open to you. I was doing what a lot of traditional activists do, which was I was sending my MP lots of petition cards, lots of online petitions, and she told me to stop. And, she t and I thought, what? You're an awful MP. Um, so I thought, well, what am I going to do? So I decided to hand embroider a message on a handkerchief, as you do, um, saying, 
don't blow it. Use your power and influence for good. I know being an MP is a tough job, um, but hopefully you really want to fight for a better world and use your position to do that. And I went and met her, and I gave her this small piece of craft that I had made on my own. It was a bit messy on the back, but it showed I, I really care about these issues. And the thing with craft is, she naturally opened up to me. We have very different ideologies. You could see as soon as she saw me, she thought, oh crap, she's gonna shout at me. And I didn't, I gave her this hanky and I said, right, what makes you tick? I told her what makes me tick, how we can collaborate and work together, how we can challenge each other. And that bit of craft, I think, is a really good tool to help us all be critical friends to each other rather than aggressive enemies where we all just block off and we don't wanna hear it. So that's another thing I think craft's bloody brilliant at. And the other thing is that activism in my job and in life as well, I kept seeing the same people and we were all knackered. We were all campaigning on so many issues because there are loads of issues to campaign on. And I wanted to engage people who were a bit nervous of politics or who wouldn't come to stuff, but I wanted to engage them in a non-threatening way that gave them time and space to think for themselves, not tell them what to do. We're all pretty intelligent human beings. I wanted to make them think and get them you know, sharing messages. So everything from cross stitch and chairs to little mini protest banners off eye level so you don't feel preached at, so people feel quite excited to go and find them and think about the quote that's on it. So this Martin Scorsese quotes in a place where my old office was where lots of young lads would hang out in Scarface t-shirts and stuff and it's all about how violence doesn't really solve anything in the end. So I thought that was a good way to get them thinking. And also, you know, with the power of technology, it's a great tool, craftivism, because it's so visual. It's a really good way to get people to share, to share it, because you're not preaching at people. So people will Instagram it, tweet it, stick it on Facebook, put it on Pinterest. All of these things means that we have been able to get hundreds of people around the world doing our projects and thousands of people supporting it and talking about it and blogging about it. And places where you wouldn't normally see activism in lots of arts and culture magazines as well. And the third thing, uh, the, the final thing, oh, I think there's four things, how awful, um, <laughs> is that craftivism as well as being a brilliant thing that goes viral online in lots of ways, it's a really good balance of doing offline and online things. So I go around with my little pop-up craftivist suitcase to workshops and events I do, but I also sometimes just sit there four square I, where I am, do a little tweet on Instagram where I am, and see if anyone wants to come and either craft with me or just have a chat. Um, and lots of people do, and it's a lovely way for people who, again, might, ne might be a bit nervous of activism to just come and have a chat through stuff and not feeling like they've got to sign up to anything. And it does cause really good conversations. The other image is in the Hayward Gallery. So again, we get to work with places outside of the activism sphere. So we did a workshop as a response to the Tracy Emin exhibition that they asked us to do. So we were looking about how to love our global neighbours and show our love, which was a bit of a dig to Tracy Emin, which was her exhibition was all about hair love and other people and people loving hair and quite inward and individualistic. And through Twitter, which I didn't expect at all, we ended up getting about 80 people there because everyone was tweeting going, I want to see our exhibition with the quilts, but this looks really good as well, so I'm specifically going to go on the day that the craftivists are there. And most people came on their own, which I thought was a brilliant way. They all came looking for other introvert, creative people who wanted to be activists. And it was such a beautiful thing to see that craft can be a bit of a bridge for people into activism. You don't have to fit into an activist mold, and you can have activism threaded through everything you do. Thanks. How do I full screen? I don't know, Adobe Reader. Full screen. Um, so just briefly to show you visually the, 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 the kind of world that, that, that I'm in. I'm, I'm with the London Hackspace. We're a large social space for people who like to make things. We have a great space in Hackney in East London. Uh, we just moved there uh, two months ago. We also have about, Jesus. Uh, uh, about 700 mem members, growing very quickly, uh, very active community. Um, 
I'm part of the organizing team for Electromagnetic Field. We organized a large hacker and maker camping festival last year. It was in Milton Keynes. Uh, we had about uh, 500 people show up and uh, come and camp and make things and do talks and so on, uh, which was amazing, it was very good. The next one is uh, coming up uh, next year and I think it'll be significantly bigger than that. And then I'm also part of, the, uh, gr uh, part of a group of people setting up a, uh, a large uh, community event at the Barbican in August um, where we bring people, bring together people from very different disciplines uh, to, to hang out and to make things and uh, to uh, teach each other a, a few things and so on. As I, I, I was super excited to be invited to this panel because I, I think it's a very interesting time for politics but also because I'm not, I, I asked the question earlier, I'm not quite sure what, what, what the politics of making is but it's, I, I spend a lot of my time in these, uh, uh, in these settings so uh, I, I started trying to figure out what, what does it mean for me. And what, the, the first thing I realized is that the, at the London Hack Space, in the very beginning, uh, people decided we actually don't want the, uh, the London Hack Space to be a political space. Uh, we, we, so at the Hack Space, we say, we're not a political organization. Politics just distracts you from making, which is evidently not true. Uh, uh, and evidently, there are going to be politics in that organization that maybe aren't as well as expressed, or maybe sort of underlying assumptions and, and underlying attitudes uh, that there are political. Um, and so, Corey, of course, uh, touched on some of that with sort of uh, notions of openness and, and open source culture and uh, uh, access and so on. Uh, and, and, and these are all interesting to look at, but also one thing that I was specifically curious about was sort of the, the politics of life choices. And also, uh, Eva mentioned that in, the, in her introduction earlier, this, this weird boundary between uh, work and life, um, where we, we need to make chase, uh, choices about where we spend what, uh, our time, which is also uh, a choice about uh, how do we earn our money and uh, to what extent does it relate to things that we want to do uh, and things that we can do. Um, and, and, and that, so I, I wanted to show a, a few aspects. Some of those you already know, some of those Maybe, maybe you don't know, and, and maybe as a, as a means of, of asking questions about, about that uh, field. So partially that relates to, relates to your, your means of production or your modes of production. How, how, do you, how do you make? What do you use to make? You, you know all these things quite well. So there are laser cutters and 3D printers and, I don't know, woodworking equipment, metalworking equipment, all kinds of other stuff. At the Hackspace we have a, a massive list of equipment that, that we have. Um, the, the interesting thing about these things is that they're not actually just things that you buy. Um, First of all, it takes quite a long time to acquire the skill to, 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 do, to use uh, for some of these things. Uh, a hammer is fairly straightforward, but a 3D printer is a highly sophisticated thing, um, which also comes with its own ethics, uh, particularly the, the 3D printers that we use, uh, they, they come with, uh, with open, uh, open source uh, licenses and uh, they, they come with a certain aesthetic, they're not necessarily super glossy and uh, what they print is not, uh, does, isn't, isn't necessarily perfect. So there are all, all these things attached to those devices that aren't actually about money. Um, and, and of course there, there are also attitudes that relate to how you use these, uh, uh, these tools that are super important. Uh, the act of, uh, of, of hacking, of tinkering, of, of play, being playful, um, the, the, the focusing on the act of creation as much as on the outcomes. Uh, another thing that I'm currently intrigued by is, is the question of uh, funding. How do you actually support yourself as a maker? How, how you, let, let, let's say you, I don't know, you found a hack space or you've found 3D printing or you found textiles. Um, how do you go from there to actually quitting your job and uh, doing what you actually want to do for a living? Actually, I'm also, I'm curious, how many of you guys consider yourselves makers and do it as a living? How many of you are able to support yourself as a maker? There are a few hands, five, maybe 10, but it's not that many. It's surprisingly hard to figure out how to do that. Um, so, the, the, and there's a whole, uh, I, I don't know, uh, 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 maze of, of, uh, of uh, potential questions in that. One thing I'm particularly interested in is, is organizing principles. And we heard, we heard about that, uh, a, a little bit from, from others already. Um, so uh, hacking on, and making is, is rarely uh, a solitary activity. Uh, often it involves uh, bringing people together and in some ways it's actually uh, quite crucial that it's a social activity as well. But as soon as you do that and especially as soon as you then have shared property like a hack space or uh, I don't know, a machine that you share, um, you, you start 
wondering about how you should organize yourselves as a group um, and, and how, you, uh, how, how do you interact as, as a group, what kind of expectations do you put place on each other and so on. Uh, and the, the interesting thing in these kinds of scenes, and particularly uh, hacker and, and maker scenes, uh, and especially also um, in places where they feed from open source culture, there's this interesting re reversal of power structures. And, and I think that that was also uh, touched on by, by a few people. And, and the, the realization that it's actually, if you're trying to figure out who should do a particular job or who should make a particular decision, uh, in these kinds of circles, it's often not the person with the highest status. Uh, it's, it's the person who has uh, the, maybe the greatest desire to do it, or, or, the, or maybe the greatest ability to do it. Uh, but it's not, um, uh, you, you, yeah, it, yeah. Let, let's leave it at that. And, and it's, it's interesting how that then shapes organizations that people build based on these attitudes. Um, and there are often organizations that are highly decentralized at the Hackspace. We have directors and trustees, but we say we're a community-run organization. The community makes uh, all, uh, all our key decisions. Um, and also, when it comes to figuring out what to do, people choose their own roles. So we have, this, we have a few rules at the London Hackspace. Uh, rule four is my favorite by far. If something is broken, fix it, don't complain. Um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a surprisingly uh, powerful rule. It's, it's, a, it's an empowering rule um, that, that relates to the, these questions. And it's interesting when a lot of people have not experienced these kinds of spaces before. And when, when someone enters such a space unprepared, it's, it's fucks, it, it fucks with their head. They don't understand it. Uh, they come to a space like that and they get the impression that it's, it's a completely disorganized group. Uh, I, I don't understand how they make decisions, first of all, but also maybe more importantly, nobody can actually tell me what to do. Um, and so, okay, so that's sort of uh, topic number three. Uh, but maybe, maybe to summarize, so in, in all of these aspects, to me, the, the politics of making is maybe about the, the politics of making particular choices for your life. Um, the, the, the will to, um, to figure out what you have and where, where you maybe want to be, and um, the, the bravery to make decisions that go against uh, received uh, wisdom, uh, the attitude that, uh, you, uh, uh, that, that you, you recognize these, these boxes that uh, people built before you, these, these categories that people uh, when you put you in, but but not accepting those boxes, but instead wanting to make your own, uh, uh, wanting to make your own uh, boxes. Uh, thank you. Okay, so um, we've heard from all of our panelists, um, and it's really quite interesting to see how, obviously, uh, the different approaches are coming through. Uh, in order to discuss what might or might not be the politics of making. As I tried to say uh, earlier, I guess for me it was always about thinking about the fact that there are power struggles uh, um, that we need to, or that, that need to be had, I guess, in, in, in some way. Um, because of... Uh, Printing guns versus fixing your own things versus um, uh, having to deal with kind of bits and pieces of proprietary software that don't allow you uh, access, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I guess it's um, th that there is there is no um, political group called the Makers. Yet we haven't got a we haven't got a political party, and I'm not even sure if that's really the the point of of today. Um, but we we do have uh, what seems to be a kind of reason for for activism. So Sarah and Nelly talked about um, you know activism as something that kind of um, is happening and needs to happen uh, for Nelly with a with a very particular focus on on Greece. Um, uh, Martin, you are involved in a in a London hack space, which you know 
to a certain extent you could maybe say is p hacking or breaking not just uh, products but actually organizational structures, uh, life choices and so on and so forth. Um, and some of these things I guess are also coming through in your book Makers which deals with um, not just hacking objects but actually hacking uh, larger corporations, hacking power structures to, to a certain extent. Um, I'm going to start with a, with a few questions for this panel and then I'm going to open this up to the rest of you. Martin has already pointed uh, at the fact that we're going to uh, hope to get you involved thinking about what the politics of making might be. Um, Sarah, question, a question for you. Um, your craftivist collective seems to be as much about getting people involved in activism as it is involved in uh, exposing social injustice. Uh, perhaps even more so, I'm not sure, I guess that's part of the question, but do you see this as one of your main aims and if so, why? Uh, is this where I can? Yeah? Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, for craftivism is a term lots of people are use, and now from everything from yarn bombing to donate and stuff, to, and for us, what we're very particular on, craftivism is doing activism but using craft. So seeing the benefits of how craft can be something to open up conversations and engage people in their own space and bring people in who don't think the activism world is for them, you know, particularly introverts. Um, so for us, it's really, it's a stepping stone and it's very much about transformation. What Nelly was saying, for us, it's a slow burner. It's about getting people to stop and think in this messy world we live in where we can be bombarded by lots of stuff and the underlying I mean our foundations in a way is to first of all remind people that even though we probably won't want to think about it we do have a hell of a lot of responsibility individually as collectives you know being in the global north as well often we have more um, power in some ways so it's getting people thinking that you're a powerful human being you have gifts and talents and you should use them to make the world a better place and not just something for you to have fun with on your own, but always thinking about society. And then, you know, so once you can be your best self and the best global citizen you can be, how do we then engage other people? But we can't try and brainwash everyone into our thinking because we know that everyone's unique and the world's messy. And there's a lot, you know, we always say craftivism should be part of the activism toolkit, so not the be all and end all. You know, we need Occupy as well. We need lots of direct action to bring media attention so others can go and have conversations with key influential people in think tanks. And all of that's needed in that recipe. But we're saying that in the activism realm, we really need time to stop and think and to engage people in a slow burner you know, more of a gentle way in many ways and try and keep that tough mind of knowing the issue, but that tender heart of trying to engage people without just screaming at each other, which we know, you know, you just look at the news now and there's just people screaming at each other and we know that doesn't work. So it's sort of challenging that. I don't know if that answers your question, though. Yes, yeah. I'm, okay, I'm good. Sure um, I mean, <laughs> over to Nelly then. I, I was wondering if your um, change makers have already thought about, I guess, specific strategies um, that you might want to uh, employ. I guess the, the question that I wrote down here is how do you envisage craft or making actively helping change along in Greece? Because you're looking at one very particular uh, context, I guess. Uh, yeah, to be honest, the whole thing is that um, we started, uh, the change maker started as based with uh, the UK, right? So it's based in the UK. But we uh, have members from all around the world. And I think this is a strong th um, aspect of uh, our group because we have people and to change ideas and to see what is the specific uh, thing that happened here in Greece. But at the same time, we had the same five years ago in London, or we have to see how people there um, defend and take action into these uh, situations. So now currently we are trying to develop a kind of strategy or actions in order to help community. And we have, of course, two parts of strategies. It's strategies that 
we have um, long-term and short-term um, benefits and results. And one of, we are trying now to have some like events in order to get people together and to see what, what are their specialities, their skills, and it's a way for, for bonding people as all the communities. And it's, it's the first step to mobilize and to activate people. And afterwards, we will manage and see how we will move this forward and to have more long-term results and that deeply have impacts on the society and economy of the place of the country. Thank you. Um, that's a question for the whole panel, um, and that's kind of going back to my uh, original introduction. Um, I'm wondering if making is an, a kind of political act or, or can be an act of resistance uh, with the potential to kind of challenge pervasive processes of late capitalism, um, or does it sit within it and really just feed an idea of free labor? And you were referring to this when you were talking about, um, you know, the, the, the really rather difficult choices one might have to make uh, in terms of the relationship between uh, life and work and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? I don't know who wants to respond. Uh, I'll take a shot at it. Um, there's a magazine called uh, Steampunk Magazine, and it has the best motto I know of, which is, love the machine, hate the factory. Uh, and, you know, if you think about the appeal of steampunk, it's, it's that they, they have a world in which you have the productivity gains of automation, which is to say enormous material wealth and enormous technological complexity, the things that we get out of factories, integrated circuits, and, um, uh, uh, you know, sub-micron level uh, um, microcontroller uh, etching, you know, microlithography and so on, all that stuff that you only get when you have assembly lines of people, but it runs like an artisanal craft shop where um, individuals don't have to sublimate their will to the rhythm of the factory. So if you're making doors and it's a nice day, you go outside to make a door that day, and if it's raining, you stay inside and you do the parts of making doors that you do inside. Um, and that's, that's kind of a craftsperson's way of working. But um, steampunk tells stories in which you have crafters who produce things that are as complicated as people who work in an assembly line where stopping to scratch your nose out of turn makes the entire line grind to a halt. Um, and we are now in this strange period of disruption where the only uh, industrial jobs that are returning to the developed world from the Pacific Rim are jobs that have been so automated that they have virtually no labor inputs, right? When you look at the stories about GE repatriating um, steam boilers uh, manufacturers to the American South, the reason they're able to do it is that almost all the labor is done by robots. And so the small differential uh, in wages, or the real differential in wages between uh, Guangzhou and South Carolina is more than uh, um, uh, compensated for by not having to pay for diesel to ship these things from Guangzhou to South Carolina. So it's cost effective to make it there. So we're effectively entering uh, a realm in which, at least industrially, we are post-job. So it's interesting that everybody talked about creating jobs. We don't seem to be creating jobs, right? We seem to be obviating jobs. And that has its own special problems. I mean, there is. There's no dignity or, or goodness in the fact that all of us use toilets, but only some of us clean them. And if toilets were self-cleaning, it would be a better world than toilets that aren't self-cleaning. But if we never found jobs for the people who cleaned toilets before, and in the absence of a job those people starved, that would be a monumental un injustice. And that's a kind of parable for the world we're living in now. And making, while not being an explicit statement about how the world should be, is nevertheless a response to this kind of post-employment, post-industrial world. Not, not post-industrial in the sense that we no longer have industry, just post-industrial in the sense that the robots do all the heavy lifting. Steampunk for years pretended that they lived in an artisanal world, that you know, you'd have beautiful artists like Jake Von Slott who would take USB keyboards that were so cheap they were effectively free and rebuild them in brass housings that he could sell for $1,000. But 
the keyboards themselves were drenched in blood. I mean, they were manufactured under horrific labor conditions. Increasingly, that's not the case. Increasingly, they're just manufactured by robots, and the horrific conditions are the fact that people are starving because nobody can get a job because the robots have taken them all. So I, I hesitate to make, uh, just, just to address your question, I hesitate to, to make sweeping state statements about uh, late capitalism, but uh, I can offer you a few personal observations. I, I, I think it, this, this question of, of, of job and life and whether you, you, you should quit your job, it, we, we, personally I've experienced again and again people who have made that choice uh, quite recently. And I, I don't know if that's about the historic time, maybe it's about my age, maybe it's about the people I hang out with, but it, it is often the, the, the realization that, yeah, you could have had a nice and safe life and a, uh, a stable income, but it was super boring. And there are all these exciting things happening around me that I want to st spend uh, time with. Um, and at the same time, that, but then also seeing that it, 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 it raises many fundamental questions about support systems of allowing that step to happen. It's, it's actually, it still is it's quite a bold choice, uh, quitting your job and then trusting yourself to carry yourself uh, in, in, in something where there is no clear career path. There's not going to be a person taking you by the hand and, and showing you the way. You ha you'll have to create it yourself. Um, but also on an organizational level, it's, it's interesting how, how little uh, support there is. The, the, the London Hackspace is, is happily independent. We, we're not looking for external funding. But we were looking into, we're a non-profit, we, we were trying to figure out, uh, can we be a charity and stop, uh, to stop paying taxes, uh, which, which would have saved us, I think, 30-40% uh, of our cost. Um, and it, it, it turns out we, we fall right in between all the categories uh, and we can't be a charity. We, we, we thought we could uh, uh, present ourselves as an educational institution, but under UK char charity law, you need to have uh, formal, formally trained educators in order to do that. We, we're not formally trained in, in anything. We, 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 we just play around. We're not very well organized. Uh, um, we, there, there, there is, uh, what was a category that, that that's more about sports clubs, uh, we, which we could have done, but that would have restricted things that we were able to do later on. So in, in the end, the summary is we, we, we can't be a charity. Um, and it's, yeah, uh, it's, uh, I'll, 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 leave, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I just want to say a quick thing. Um, so I do this full time now. Um, well, trying, so just about, but excited about my free lunch. <laughs> so I can get some free food. Um, but I think in the, in the making community with craft that I do, all the handmade stuff, it, it's got a, quite a trend now. Lots of people are joining in craft, whereas before they'd look at you really embarrassed and say, my friends would say, don't craft in public with me because it's really embarrassing. Now they all want to do it. But there's a real trend that if you have a passion for something, you shouldn't get paid for it. I mean, I used to work in the charity sector and loads of people would be like, I want to don donate my money, but you should all be working for free. And I think there's a real balance between saying, yes, you have a passion, and, but also for people to say, and we will support that because you have the motivation to work really hard most freelancers work you know crazy hours you work really hard and you're building up a, you know expertise that we should value so I think sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot in the in the maker community where we ask people to do a hell of a lot for free knowing that they're freelance and they work on their own and we don't value them so this is a little bit of a kick for us to say you know we, we need to look at our community first and then look outside as well and say you know if we want to be really good at what we do I feel like I'm the best I am now because I've been able to give up my job I was bent out doing it on top of a full-time job and I was bent out doing it with a part-time job so it was this and this is a bit of a make or break year for me in a way but there is a real issue that if someone cares about something, that's great, but don't ask them to do it for free because then you know, they won't be able to be really good at it and we'll actually stunt them in their creativity and their expertise. I, I really like that you bring that up uh, in, in, in a number of ways. Uh, at the London Hackspace, it's, it's a very present... Yeah, thank you. At, at, at the London Hackspace, it's, it's a very present uh, discussion. We, we had, uh, about a month ago, we, we had a discussion on the mailing list. Uh, should we... We, we have regular events and workshops where, where people show each other stuff, but usually they're, they're free events, open to anybody. Um, and for the first time, we started having a discussion about how a maker is supposed to make a living, and does, does, that, also, does that not also mean that 
we should encourage paid events as well, where the person that hosts the event, that spends time setting it up, that um, uh, organizes materials and so on, uh, gets, gets paid for their work. Um, and uh, for, for, for us, that was a surprisingly big step to make. Uh, it was to, to us, it was not self-evident that it might be important. Mm -hmm. it, it, it becomes a barrier of entry because suddenly you need to pay in order to participate. But there maybe there are ways of, of, of uh, not having that be a barrier. But, but it, but it, it, it allows someone to... Yeah. It shows commitment in the people who've bought the ticket as well, that they're offering something so it's very mutually beneficial and, and respectful with each other, which I think is lovely. <laughs> Um, shall we open the discussion to the, to the rest of you? And I guess the question still stands that Martin asked earlier. What might be the politics of making? Tell us the answer, please. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's open for questions. So if there are any questions, there's a hand over there. Do, you have, do we have a runner with a mic? Hello. Um, I'd like to ask the panel, how do you feel that the concept of risk adverseness, where we have now a culture where you do not take risk, you do not take a risk even to break something to see if you can make something better from it. If you were to make something and you were there to try and make a commercial, a commercial, a bull product, even at an artisan level, that if you were to sell something, you would then become responsible for it and then we have a whole barrier of legal risks that you have to become averse to. Maybe we need to find a way within the making community to say it is good to take risk at all levels because you need to learn the responsibilities of taking those risks and if you can take those risks within reasonable terms then you should carry on doing what you're doing. A classic example is I don't know an educator that would give a ten year old a soldering iron. Yet how how can they hurt themselves with a soldering iron that doesn't require you run their finger under a tap for 10 minutes and go, you just learned something there, haven't you? Yeah, but you, you just don't get educators do that. They won't give them tools that result in things flying around. Yet we have this whole belief that there was supposed to be a thing about conquer wearing and safety glasses. Companies will sue your little derriere off if you do something with their equipment. It's all risk, it's all fear, and that the politics of making, really, as far as I can see, is walking away from those fears. Would you like to to, just to, I, I like your example of the, the, the young child and the soldering iron, because I've, I've been in situations where exactly that question came up. Uh, and, of course, the, the educator is, is not to blame. It's, uh, the, uh, they, maybe, maybe there are personal concerns uh, behind their decisions as well, but more, more, uh, more likely than not, it's... Uh, a legal framework that forces them into, into making that uh, decision, uh, questions of liability and so on. Uh, when we set up events with kids, we, we start looking at these kinds of questions and questions of liability and, and CRB checks and all of that. Uh, but we, in the end, we found, we found the quickest way of getting around all that mess is to, just to make sure that a parent or gu legal guardian is present. And suddenly you can do anything that you want to do. And it's, it's up to the person and the child to make their own choices. Uh, so that there, I think there are ways of encouraging uh, the taking of risks without it becoming uh, a matter of contracts or uh, legalities. I think it's really nice as well if you give, like I do some youth events but try and focus on adults really, um, but when the parents are there and you give the kids scissors and needles, you know, and you say, watch out yourself, but I'm going to give you these and I trust you can use them well and you're doing something delicate. You know, they feel really respected and valued as well that you've given them this stuff and they might, you know, look at their parent like, is this all right? And the parent's going, yeah, yeah, go do it. Same with badgers and all these things. I think it's a really lovely way to show that, you know, you believe they can do something exciting with it. And if they break it or hurt themselves, they've got people around them who love and support them. So yeah, it really annoys me when you've got to put all this red tape around and all this bubble wrap around. I mean, one thing it, It's well, super important that all these things do yeah. go wrong. Yeah. It's so important. Yeah, you only, that I mean, they hurt I themselves, only, that they put well, things on fire that from, they didn't want to... Uh, I only learned from mistakes. I mean, all the stuff I do wasn't a strategy at all. It was, I want to do this, I'm going to test it out, and then suddenly all these people wanted to join in when we're still figuring out what works and what doesn't. But one of the things we struggle with, which makes um, links to your point, 
is our images are often, you know, outside Topshop, and the fr we've got this little book out, it's very little, it's got very low brow, so um, lots of images and small things. We couldn't have a certain image on the front cover because the editor was crapping herself that we'd get sued, and then that would, I'd be sued, and then I'd have absolutely no money because they'd take all my personal money, and, and it was really upsetting because it was a really lovely image, and lots of people use it online, and that drives me insane. I just think it's not fair. I don't know what to do about it, though. Well, this is where I'm feeling that we have a culture now that makes sure we are scared, and that the making is I mean, about I, stepping away from that and going, I'm not going to be scared anymore. It's I'm a going to take responsibility for what I do. If I want to make an underwater toaster, I have to understand the principles behind <laughs> making an underwater toaster, but so, it's my responsibility. It's a multifactorial problem. It, it impacts lots of areas. Obviously, this is a problem with aviation. Mm -hmm. It's a problem with child rearing. There's a great movement called uh, Free Range Kids, sort of yeah. by a woman in New York called Lenore Skenazi, and, and she's terrific. But this is, you know, this is up and down and side to side, you know, um, and, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of the reaction to risk, like a lot of the, uh, to, to uh, over risk aversion, just like a lot of the tort reform in the United States, is not um, people who legitimately just want to be able to take more chances. It's uh, um, big industry using the guise of people wanting to be able to take more chances to allow them to operate less safe workplaces, right? And so it's, it's, really, it's really difficult. Just like tort reform is often like, well, we must get rid of these spurious lawsuits. Uh, but when you, when you look at the people funding the tort reformers, they're, they're companies that have been sued because their cars were deliberately made unsafe and they exploded on low, low speed rear impact collisions. So it's, I mean, the, the, it's, a, it's an incredibly complicated issue. Uh, and um, I, I, I agree that it's a huge problem. As a parent, it's a huge problem. Uh, just, just the pressure you get from other parents if you let your kid do anything. Mm. Hello, um, thanks for a very interesting discussion. Um, I think it's such a colossal question and that the perspective that the panel's coming from are very different perspectives. Because um, Corey, you're coming more, I think, from a business perspective in terms of my interpretation. We're talking about copyright, but then Nelly is talking more about actual politics and social issues that are affecting everyone around the world. Um, but I think a lot of it actually boils down to the person and the self because everything, this is like my weird perspective, that everything we make as creatives is an extension of ourself, um, because it's like our world, it's how we see the world, and we're sharing that with other people, whatever form or genre that is, and that we all have our own personal politics that we live by. So for example, my work is that I'm a free runner, and I create um, interactive uh, installations that simulate the experience of being a free runner. And I have actually gone through that process in myself of, overcoming fear when I do my training that has then affected me as a person and how it affects me um, I look at it universally and share through my work and hopefully other people can tap in on that level and that when I do workshops with young people um, who are maybe eight or seven and we're saying jump off that wall and they're like whoa you know and there's so much issues if you're doing that outside and health and safety we know that when we fall off the wall it's really not the end of the world you know you might just hurt or scrape your leg or whatever so we're all very we've got our crbs we've done our training but we also know within ourselves it's really not a big deal you know if you don't take that leap of faith you're always going to be on the wall and you're never going to do anything or go anywhere that's like the worst thing that can possibly happen is that you stay on the wall so we're just like just jump off what's the worst that can happen and they jump off and some of them fall and some of them catch the other end but they get there you know and it's that process that doing so um my, my kind of comment is that it's almost impossible to answer this question because it's just personal. Because as we make things, it's completely personal. And that the only politics we can bring is kind of the trueness of ourself to it and that integrity. And that's, that is the politics of making. Nice answer. Thank you. <laughs> I had a question over here. So there were some great uh, topics about value creation and you know having a pr price point for your tickets because you value what you're getting there. It's just not a free event. I was wondering if the panel had some great examples of making new kind of business models. So you know the problem we have is obviously you can write a book and you can you know still make money as an author, or you can do a, a Kickstarter crowdfunding uh, kind of a thing. But what as as makers are we actively innovating? 
as you know business models because obviously there's you know, the legal guys have a very good business model of suing and so there must be ways in which you know you guys have come across some interesting examples of new kind of business models for the kind of things that you're you're making up building I, I think that's also a great question for all of you because you're more people than we are you have uh, collectively you have way more life experience than we have uh, but guys I just wanted to mention, because I'm in the middle of one of these, uh, the Humble ebook bundles, which mm -hmm. have been very, very successful. And they came out of the Humble Indie Bundle, which is the, the video game bundles where they gang together half a dozen DRM-free cross-platform video games and then let people name their price and give them some feedback about price setting. They say, you know, you're a Mac user, Mac users are giving this much, and they're trailing Linux users by this much. If you want to help Team Mac, you know, you should give at least this much and so on. And, and the first one of these for video games about uh, in 2007 did over a million dollars business in two weeks. They're two week long promotions and was the most successful, I think, indie game sales of, any t of, of all time. And each one of those games would have been top of the charts on every game sales chart in the world that, those two weeks. Uh, by the time they got up to their seventh one, three or four years later, they, they closed $5 million in two weeks. We did the first one with eBooks last fall, with um, included my novel Pirate Cinema, which has just come out in the UK. And again, we did 1.25 million in two weeks. Uh, we've just done the second one. We've just launched the second one. It's, it's cl closing in on $300,000. It's three days old uh, and has another 11 days to run. And our biggest problem has been that the publishers just won't um, uh, allow their authors in because the publishers demand d digital rights management. But so far, uh, we've had Macmillan, which is one of the big five publishers, and we just had a second one come in and say, can we be involved in future ones? So there is, those name your price things for digital ones are pretty interesting, and, and my observation whenever anyone asks me about name your price is that in the digital world, it's already a name your price uh, world de facto because it takes the same number of clicks to get something for free from the Pirate Bay as it does to pay for it, but the only two prices we accept are full retail and zero. And so there's a whole range of prices between zero and full retail and some over full retail because the, the, big, the big spenders on Humble Bundles sometimes give hundreds of dollars. And uh, it's worth pursuing those, especially in the digital world. We um, crowdfunded for half of our book, which is a bit random. So Thames and Hudson gave half the money but said it was a bit too niche, but they really liked it. And for us, that was perfect because we had half of their money, but all their expertise, a brilliant editor that I love and have worked with before. But then we also got to say to our craftivism community, come on, guys, we can do it. Let's do it together, which is what I love about crowdfunding. And I crowdfund whenever I get birthday money or something. I look for things on Kickstarter and Indiegogo because I just... I think it's such a beautiful concept. But that, for us, worked really well. And I'm sort of trying to do a bit of a pick and mix of all the good corporate stuff that you can get that's really good models and all the good grassroots stuff and for us our community loved the fact that a big publishing respected publishing house and it's Kikeda underneath who do it all and do lots of beautiful craft books and urban books and street art and stuff knowing that they supported us and then we found the rest of the money and got 120 people I think who funded it was such a beautiful thing to say you know Lots of these models work. We don't have to be purist and go down one route. So a bit of pick and mix. And we, you know, we sell our craftivism kits. We don't give them for free. We can't afford to. Charities often give you pens and badges and stickers for free, and you don't value them. You put them in the bin because you haven't bought them. So for us, again, that's a bit of a strange model, but actually it shows commitment from the people because if they don't buy it, them less likely to spend time making it, or the same with our products. You know, they value them because they've bought into them, and they've bought into you. So I think sometimes we can go down a bit of a purist route, or try and look for something completely different that we need to invent, when actually a bit of pick and mix and can make and a bit of breaking and then putting it back together in your context. What you said, I think it can work quite well, but I'm still learning all of this. Was a um, question uh, by a gentleman here in a white shirt? I think he's been. So while, while, while you're waiting for your mic, just very briefly, I'm, I'm a big fan of community models. Uh, uh, there, there was a, a very successful Kickstarter campaign that came out of the Music Hackspace for, for the Hoxton Owl. It's a, a programmable effects pedal that you can write effects for. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing a community of software developers uh, uh, emerge around that. 
and then musicians who, who work with those developers uh, uh, to build things together, to build effects uh, together uh, on uh, using this uh, using this platform, uh, and and they're they're running that as a business. It's it's it's, it's an open hardware design. Uh, it's uh, a uh, the, the the source code for for the uh, for the uh, uh, for the pedal is is public, um, and it's 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 going to mostly go, is going to be created through the community. Okay, um, so I'm thinking about so I really really applaud everyone doing the activism side and the business side and every kind of combination between, but I think there's a lot of other people who are making who aren't doing it for those reasons at all. Um, I think we've kind of touched upon it a bit, but for me, there's a kind of politics of making that is wasting time. We're kind of living in this world where we're kind of super quantified on everything. You know, we have to show that this is useful and we've, you know, this is contributing to this, that, and the other. The actual act of just going home and wasting time on something that's useless is wonderful. And in my opinion, anyway, um, kind of self, there's a kind of, it's, it's, it's about, um, Creation and self-identity and so forth for me. Um, that's not really a question. <laughs> so uh, I think you're right that wasting time is lovely. And, and, it's, and it's not just wasted because it's so often to amuse our friends. It's to delight other people. And really that, that is itself a form of activism. That, that it's a form of service mm -hmm. to want to, to wanna delight other people. I have a friend who says that Burning Man is like a post-scarcity society because the only reason to do something at Burning Man is to delight other people. Uh, and so I, I, I agree, and I also think that the trivial builds up, accumulates into the substantive. Sometimes we have people say, well, wh why, uh, why should we value the internet? It's full of cat pictures and, and people saying silly things to each other of no consequence. And really, you know, the reason that you ask your partner over breakfast, how did you sleep last night, isn't that you don't know. If you share a bed, you probably do. It's because the, profound, the profundity of your relationship is built on a million trivialities. And those, those, those trivial communications, those trivial actions are what lead to profundity. And play is where insight comes out of. Um, you know, it's, it's playing and noodling and doing things that are consequence free where you discover, you know, your eureka moment. So it's the politics of wasting time. Mm. <laughs> I, I'm gonna be a bit of devil's advocate on that though. I um, cross-stitched my phone with a lovely quote from the Dalai Lama about try and help people, and if you can't do that, at least don't harm them. I think my worry a bit is, and I always think the worst in some ways is, well, what if you're on your own for hours in your basement, on your computer, doing those horrible things you mentioned, what was it called, racking or something? Ratting. Ratting. You know, that's not great, but you might be having loads of fun. And so I guess, in a way, it's sort of making sure you have yourself challenging yourself and other people around you go and hang on a minute or if you're making something where all the components are all made in very unethical places and you're not challenging them you know you can still buy from them often as a consumer you have more consumer power than if you boycott and all of these issues so i think it's great but we shouldn't just f it's easy in in the uk sometimes to just ignore everything and then there's also that worry that it just fuels individualism and we forget we're part of society so you see a hell of a lot of young people saying that they're all a brand now and i do this i'm a brand i make t-shirts i do dj and then here's my card and it's very much about them and you, i worry that there's a real disconnect and there's that competition and individualism and Yes, I worried about asking the question because I also really, really liked your opening slide with the, um, you know, the uh, evil comes when good people... That's outside South Ken. Stay right, up for a while. Yeah. Which is good. Um, because, but I think there's a, there's a kind of reality of it as well, though, right? I mean, we're talking about what the politics are making out right now. Um, I think, you know, there are lots of people doing this for amusing their friends or... I mean, for good reasons, but, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think so we have time for one last question. Yeah, we're going to take just one last okay. question. Um, I just wanted to make a, an, another comment. Um, as far as I can see, a lot of things are now uh, no longer material. They're being made digitally, right? And as soon as you talk about what is something, even if it's your own, digitally, you require those very controls that are problematic. You require the software programmer to enable you to put parentheses around something and own it. And that requires software to be built so that you can own 
certain aggregates or disaggregates of whatever it is that you're producing. So that we have a, a problem here, right? We, ha we need these very uh, controls that are an anathema to uh, open creativity. Sorry, why, why do we need them? What, what for? Because if you, you don't own any, if you, if you write a do, piece do you need of to code, own it? if you write a co piece of code, or you create an image, or you create uh, a movie, or you create anything yourself, you want for that to be a thing, a discrete thing with ownership, which is even makes it worth your time tinkering or whatever creative way you make it, it doesn't matter, or even if you make it in a disciplined way, you've got to, that, that it doesn't exist unless you can control it. That, thank, you for be, yeah, thank you for and, clarifying that. I think I, I, right. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of probing and po uh -huh. uh, uh, po uh, sort of poking at that because I, I, think, I don't think it's self-evident that we need to own all these things. I think we are now negotiating to what extent is that but a question of ownership? But not even ownership, it doesn't exist unless you, it, it, nothing exists unless you can actually control it. It's not even ownership, it does not exist digitally so unless I, you can limit, the, put a boundary around this bit of code or whatever. I think this ties back into the earlier question about when is copyright appropriate. And I think that copyright has historically been the industrial regulation of the entertainment industry. There's nothing wrong with an industry having rules. I always say it'd be great if the finance industry had rules. And the way that those rules were made was by codifying practices within the industry. And we can argue about whether they're the right rules or the wrong rules, and whether they favor the forces of capital or creators or whatever. But I think that what's what's been problematic is those rules have metastasized because the thing that we used to use to test whether you were in the industry is whether you were making or handling a copy on the grounds that if you had a copy of a record, there was a record factory in its provenance and so something industrial had taken place. And copies are no longer an indicator of, in, of industrial activity. All, everything you do with a computer involves making copies. And so saying everything you do with a computer is therefore subject to the industrial regulation of the entertainment industry is, is a nonsense because there is no set of rules that is nuanced and complex enough that Universal can use them to license Harry Potter from Warner and make a Universal Harry Potter theme park, and simple enough that a kid in her mom's basement in Milton Keynes can make a Harry Potter fan website and not fall afoul of them. We may need rules for how we culturally interact with, inf with information goods. I mean, we have lots that aren't part of copyright law. We have rules about plagiarism that you can still fall afoul of even if you violate no copyright. Plagi plagiarizing Shakespeare violates no copyright, but will still get you kicked out of uni. Um, and so I'm, I'm not in, in, uh, opposed to rules per se. I just think that it's silly to say that just because you use copies in the 21st century, you are part of the entertainment industry and should figure out and follow its rules. Not because rules are bad, but because it, it won't produce an outcome in which people are actually following those rules. It'll just produce an outcome in which everyone is, is always violating rules all the time. I'm so sorry, I think we have to finish now because yes. yeah, it's no, already absolutely. past 12.30. We're coming back at 1.30 here uh, with Tim Hankin uh, opening uh, with the, the first talk.